in John chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 1 today. Last week was uh, what we called Servant Sunday, and we decided to continue in that theme of servanthood this morning. You'll see the, the red serving card there in the seat back in front of you is still there, and I just encourage you to, to grab a hold of that through the remainder of the service. See where the Lord leads you. See where he may bring you into joining the story uh, that we see here in John 13 and joining the story of Grace Community Bible Church. John chapter 13 and verse 1, we're going to read some scripture this morning. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, You shall... Never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. And after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. And one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered him, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he dipped the morsel of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. And when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children... Yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
Let's pray. Who is the king of glory? He's strong and mighty, and he wages war. Who is the king of glory, Lord? He's shown here as a humble, loving servant. Oh, Lord, so we ask, I ask for myself, speak, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Sporting his uniform of blue jeans and a black turtleneck, Apple's CEO and co-founder Steve Jobs took to the stage at the Macworld Conference in San Francisco on January 9th, 2007. This is a day, that Jobs said, quote, that I have been looking forward to for two and a half years. He said, every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh, and it didn't just change Apple, it changed the whole computer industry. In 2001, we introduced the first iPod, and it didn't just change the way that we listen to music, it changed the entire music industry. And Jobs goes on to say, today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. With revolutionary user interfaces, a sophisticated operating system, and a design that is wonderful for your hand to hold. He would go on for nearly an hour describing and showcasing what would be the iPhone. What would come to be something in which we would communicate with and be able to communicate through this revolutionary and breakthrough communications device. And if I were a betting man, you and I, or the majority of you and I, are fulfilling that vision in which Jobs gave in 2007. In a similar fashion, and yet a much desperate and passion-filled way, Jesus came to his disciples this night and said, I have earnestly desired to have this meal with you. And he said, I'm going to reinvent this Passover meal. I'm going to give you this bread, which is my body broken for you, this cup of the new covenant, which is my blood poured out for you. I'm about to change the world. And in verse 34 here in chapter 13, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And Jesus dipped that morsel of bread that so many call sop and handed that sop over to Judas, looking at him and telling him that whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. And at once Judas left that upper room and he took off in which the betrayal of Jesus was sent into motion. And there at the start of Jesus' betrayal, which would lead into the torturing of his body, of him eventually being hung by nails on a wooden cross, and buried in a tomb, and then resurrecting three days later, there at the start of these events, Jesus says here in verse 34, I have a new commandment for you. I have a new commandment. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Why are you saying this is a new commandment, Jesus? What is so new about this commandment, Jesus? Jobs, Steve Jobs, what is so new about this iPhone that you are releasing into the world? We already have phones, we can communicate. We actually even had smartphones at the time. We had some Motorola's, we had Blackberries that even had keyboards and email, and internet on them. What is so new about these iPhones? And Jesus, what is new about this commandment that you're giving us? We already have love. In fact, we've already had a command to love. Leviticus 
1918 told us, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. Watch, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, he says. So what is so new? What is new about this commandment, Jesus, for us to love one another? The word word here translated as new in verse 34 is like that first iPhone in that the command of God is new in respect to its form as well as its substance. Its form is, is unused. It's fresh. It's fresh for obedience. And its substance is unprecedented. It's unheard of. Never seen or experienced before is this new commandment. And just like the world, uh, you and I never experienced or saw an iPhone, neither have we experienced or faced a love like this. A love so humble, a love so perfect, and a love so sacrificial and, and seeking of the ones that Jesus pursued. Yes, we had the command to love our neighbor as ourself. But we never had the example of love like Jesus Christ. So as Matthew 13, 52 says, like a master of a house, Jesus here is bringing out of his treasure things that are old and things that are new. And he is commanding us to love one another just as he loved us. Loving one another is of old, but loving like Jesus loved is new. And that is the key here, to love one another just as I have loved you. Can I keep saying it? Just as I have loved you. Now hold on to that because that's where we're going to return and come back to because Jesus didn't stop there in verse 34. He goes on, if you would look at verse 35, where he says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By you loving one another just as I have loved you, Jesus is saying, this is how all people will know that you are my disciples. All people will know. This is a huge statement. Are you, are you here today? You ready? Yeah. This is a massive statement for us. By this, all people will know that you follow Jesus, that you and I here today in Venice Florida, people out on the road should know that you and I follow Christ by the way in which we love one another. And these two verses, 34 and 35, are so reorienting to the disciples there that night and should be to you and I here this morning. Because of that reorientation, I think a few definitions in verse 35 would be helpful. Uh, Verse 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples. Now, if you've been a part of this church for some amount of time, I need your help, and you should be able to, because he says, by this, all people. Here's a first quick and easy one. All people means all people. All people people will know that you are my disciples. The entirety of humanity, every person in Venice And throughout the world should know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ by in which the way you love other believers. If a group of you went over to Starbucks right now, the people in Starbucks should know that you are a Jesus follower by the way in which you interact and serve and love one another. It's all people. But what will they know? Jesus says that they will know that you are my disciples. It's just jargon that just is thrown around among us. But what, what is a disciple, Jesus? Define that. Because if we're here today, this morning, and we believe unto Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and our, our new life found in him, we better understand and know how his word, the Bible, defines us. And let me just pause there for a moment because that's, one of the reasons in which we gather here every Sunday morning is to open this word and to see and feed on how 
we are defined. God defines you. And so a couple of plumbers and a Reynolds get to stand in front of you and see how uh, God is defining us and we get to show you God is the one who defines you. And a disciple is a learner. There are those who follow after one's teaching. So they're being schooled and they are following their teacher. Acts 11.26 says it simply, In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So very basically, a disciple is one uh, who confesses Jesus as the Messiah, as the Redeemer of a sin-filled people and one who follows his teachings and his life. Jesus says here that every tongue, every nation, every tribe will know that you follow me if you have love for one another. In his first letter, John writes, quote, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Jesus is saying, this is your badge. This is the trademark of the Christian. Love. Love one another. When you serve here at Grace Community Bible Church, we try our best to uh, identify those who are serving. So those who serve on the prayer team get a lanyard, this name badge, so that when they stand up front, should someone want to pray with someone else, they can look up front and see that person with a blue prayer team lanyard around their neck and be able to identify them as the prayer team and go pray with them. Or you can see our safety team wearing these yellow shirts that identify them as people who are watching over us and protecting and loving us and serving us here on a Sunday morning. Or Grace Kids who wear the shirts, who have the lanyards. Or our hospitality team or those who seat. We want those who are serving here on a Sunday morning to be identifiable so that those who may be new here know who to go ask the questions. Or if you need a seat you can know who will give you that seat. We identify them. And even in preparing this last meal is a picture of this. In Luke, where Jesus tells us that Peter and John, a couple of disciples, they wanted to know where they were going to eat this last meal. So they ask him, where do you want us to go prepare this meal, Jesus? And he tells them, when you go into the city, you're going to see a man carrying a jar of water. Is is that just not incredible? You're going to go into the city. You're going to see a guy carrying a jar of water. And they found that man, and that man led them to this upper room, furnished and ready for them to partake. But Jesus told his disciples, there's this guy with a a jar of water, and he's going to lead you into where you need to go. He gave the disciples an identifier as to where to go. And here in John 13, Jesus is distinguishing you and I as disciples of Jesus Christ with an identifier. If we have love for one another. In other words, if someone out there, out in the world of Venice right now, wanted to find a Christian, someone ought to be able to say, well, go to Grace Community Bible Church by about 9 to 12.30 on a Sunday morning. And they will say, well, how will I know if they are Christians? And they ought to be able to say to them, not because there's a sign over the building, but because when you peer into that building, you're going to see a bunch of knuckleheads loving each other as if the world has never seen before. The Bible calls us ambassadors. We are ambassadors or agents of God carrying with us the greatest news in the world to the greatest problem in the world. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. And in his book, Parenting, Paul Tripp shows that good parenting begins with a humble recognition that our children don't actually belong to us, but rather to the one who created him or her. He says that that means, quote, God's plan for parents 
is that we would be his agents in the lives of those who have been formed into his image and entrusted to our care. Trip calls parents ambassadors. And he says, this really is the perfect word for parents. For what God has called parents to be and do. And I'm arguing here that John 13, 35 is saying that all who claim Christ as their Lord and Savior are called to be ambassadors. And they are given a trademark of love. Tripp goes on in that book to say, the only thing an ambassador does if he's interested in keeping his job is to faithfully represent the message, methods, and character of the leader who has sent him. He is not free to think, speak, or act independently. Everything he does, every decision he makes, and every interaction he has must be shaped by this one question. What is the will and the plan for the one who sent me? And according to John 13, 35, the answer to that question is love. To love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples or my ambassadors if you have love for one another. And since, listen, I'm the pastor of community here. Since we are ambassadors Since we are disciples of Jesus Christ, that means that we are a sent people. Ambassadors are sent. And that means we are a sent people, sent by Jesus to produce more and more disciples and baptize them and produce more and more disciples who then go and produce more and more disciples. And what I see here in verse 34 and 35 is that it seems that God expects us to be together. It just seems like he's commanding us to be together. He's telling us all people will know what a Christian ought to look like and smell like and act like by the way in which they love one another. We can't love one another if we're not together. We need each other. We need each other here on a Sunday morning to gather and to encourage and build up and confess sin and take communion and be baptized. But we need so much more than this service. That's why we have gospel communities here at this church, a small group ministry where you can plug in with other disciples and love and join one another throughout the week. And so I just encourage you, go online, sign up for a gospel community. And join it and be a part of it and serve one another and and show the community as a group our trademark, which is love. So then how do we love one another? Probably seems absolutely redundant at this point. But how we love one another through this commandment is that we are to love one another just as he has loved us. And we must start by considering this reality that disciples who love one another were only able to do so, to do so to the standard at which God has given us because we, they have been recipients of something. That those who love one another just as he has loved us, they're only able to because they've been on the receiving end of the love of God that is now like a well of water just bubbling up in them and out of them as their identity onto each other. They're on the receiving end. He could have said, love one another with hard work. He could have said, love one another sacrificially. Shoot, he could have even repeated himself from Leviticus 19 and said, love one another as you love yourself. But he didn't say that. He was here on this earth, 100% man, 100% God, not only giving us and supplying us with the ultimate representation of love, but he ultimately loved and loves you and I. 
And that's why it's a new commandment. That's why he says in 1 John 4.19 that we love not only because we are commanded to love, but that we love because he first loved us. We receive his grace and his love and his mercy and that just changes us. And these loving disciples who serve and love one another. This is truly true supply and demand. In love, God through Jesus Christ has supplied us with everything we need for life and godliness. Second Peter 1. And he demands. This is the, a demand of you, Christian. He charges us to overflow with that supply onto one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. When we read that verse here in 2019 on this side of the cross, we so quickly and rightly so, I believe, just bolt and jump to the cross. We go right to the cross when we see just as I have loved you. We go right there where Jesus was crucified for our sin. And I think we're right in doing that. But unlike the disciples in the upper room that night, we get to do that because we have the rest of the New Testament. We have John 15, 13 that says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. We have Romans 5 that tells us, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or 1 John 4.10 where we read, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So yes, see the cross when you hear, just as I have loved you. Don't ever forget it. Mark it in your brain. That's why we have it just sitting up here on the stage. Don't ever forget when you wake up in the morning, see your sins crucified on Jesus in the cross. Rest in that. Abide in it. Moment by moment, minute by minute, every day. It is yours, Christian. But for the sake of John 13, let's consider how Jesus loved the disciples prior to the cross. Let's keep in the text. When you're reading the Bible, try to stay in the text as much as you can before you compare to other scriptures. See what is there. Look at verse 12 with me. It says, When he had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus got up in the middle of the Last Supper the night there before he would be brutally executed. He took off his outer garments, he picked up a towel, wrapped it around his waist, he filled a bucket up with water, and he went one by one to each of his men, to each of his disciples. And he got down on that dirty ground, he untied their sandals, and thinking about him untying sandals this week, I, I just think of John the Baptist saying, there is one coming where I can't even bend down to untie his sandal. And yet he's here, bending down and taking their sandals off and scrubbing their dirty feet. Feet are nasty. <laughs> and he is on that nasty ground, wiping these nasty feet Rinsing them and repeating and moving over to the next guy. I bet one of them thought, wait till he gets to him. <laughs> and as one commentator said, he poured water into a basin 
and began to wash the disciples' feet, just as in a few short hours he was to pour out his blood for the washing away of human sin by the atonement. And when he was through, he asked if they understood what he just did. Now, clearly they understood that he just washed their feet. Jesus is getting at the the spiritual. He's getting at the heart of what he just did. He's getting at the example of love and service that he just provided all of humanity to them. And he said, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. If I then, if I then, just stopped me this week in studying and meditating on this, those three words, if I then, that's why I gave the title of this, if I then, Jesus is saying, you call me teacher and Lord, capital T, teacher and capital L, Lord, if I then, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, in whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through me and for me. And I'm before all things, and in me all things hold together. And I am the head of the body, the church, and I'm the beginning the firstborn from the dead, and in me the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Colossians 1. If I then, if I then, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of the nature of God, the one who is at this moment, at 1020 in 2019, is upholding the universe right now by the very power of his word, the one who is sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high, if I then, he who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, if I then, who sleeps in the back of a boat during a hurricane and when wakes up, looks out at the waves and the wind and says, peace, be still. And the waters calm and the winds cease. If I then, He who takes barrels of pure water and turns them into aged Pinot Noir. If I then, the one who just took a man who was dead four days in a tomb and raised him back to life at the command of my voice. If I then, the one who when he teaches does so as one who had authority and not as the scribes and caused the crowds to marvel at me wondering where my studies had come from and and caused the officers who were sent to arrest me to leave empty-handed and go back to those who sent them and say, no one has ever spoken like this man. If I then cause a ruler of the Jews to come to me and say, we know, we know that you are a teacher come from God and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. If I then, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. My wife, Melissa, and I waited tables. We served tables uh, all the way, actually from high school all the way through college. We met at uh, Aston Gardens here in Venice, and we served uh, the old folk, and then we went to college, and we both got a job serving the same place and uh, made our way uh, into married life, waiting tables. And uh, while we were there in college, we were working the same shift. And uh, when we got to work one night, our manager quickly came up to us and said, hey, you guys are both working a party together, uh, which is fine. That's something that normally happens. You get a big party, you need more than one person to to make it efficient and work well. And so uh, he said, you're working that shift together. And he seemed kind of uptight and nervous about it, didn't know why, until he told us that we were going to be serving uh, John Henry. 
Now, John Henry, if you don't know, I didn't know at the moment, uh, is the owner of the Boston Red Sox, the owner. And so he was a little nervous about making sure he was served well. I didn't know who he was, nor did I care for the Red Sox. I care for real teams, like <laughs> the Reds. But Melissa and I got in there and we started rushing around, making sure our uniforms looked good and making sure the carpets were clean where he was going to be sitting and the silverware was placed just as it needed to be. And we found out that he was flying in on his jet with his family and they decided to have dinner there. And so as they got there, we escorted them back to their private table and we began to take their orders and, and waited on them hand and foot. No other tables were given to us so that we could be near them and, and serve them well. Now, I just cannot imagine, in the middle of us taking orders, that John Henry would stand up and go to the bus station and grab a apron and a pen and a pad and tell us to sit down. <laughs> I was telling Melissa I was going to share that today, and she said, I just can't believe he picked us to serve them. I can't imagine... This guy with a net worth of $2.7 billion telling us to sit down so that he could serve us. To go to our broke college level from his private jet lifestyle. And yet, how much harder is it for me to imagine the one who created and sustains the very breath of John Henry and filling a bucket of water and bending over his knees and to this low slave-like position and washing the dirt off of my feet. I think I would be like Peter. Not me, Lord. You ain't washing me. This is how he loved them, and this is how he loves us. He who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus is saying, I disrobed and took on the form of a servant so that you too can disrobe yourself and your ego and you can serve and love one another. And this is what the love of Christ is. It is a humble, sacrificial Philippians 2 love of doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, counting others more significant than yourselves. Paul Tripp goes on in his book saying, The ambassador does not represent his own interest, his own perspective, or his own power. He does everything as an ambassador or he has forgotten who he is, and he will not be in that position for long. My daughter just completed preschool this year, and at the very beginning of her school year, uh, she came home one of those early days and said, Daddy, I got to tell you something. And I said, go for it. What, what's going on? And she said, Daddy, my teacher taught us today that uh, we are either going to be bucket fillers this year or bucket dippers this year. And I said, that's interesting, sweetheart. What does that mean? And she said, well, bucket fillers are people who do nice things and love and care for other people. And bucket dippers are those who just don't, who dip into other people's buckets and take from them. Yeah. And her teacher is right on. And Jesus shows us here that the type of servant who he was, the type of bucket that he was and is commanding us to be, is to be bucket fillers. Those who fill up buckets and carry them over to our brothers and sisters and get down way lower than they are and wash their dirty feet. Francis Chan wrote, at the core of our faith lies the belief that Almighty God humbled himself to serve us and die for us. And at the root of our calling is a command to imitate him by serving one another. God wants you to resemble his son. And then he says this. He wants you to resemble his son, especially when you gather 
as a church family. Hey, when you show up here on a Sunday morning, are you anxious and eager looking for ways in which you can serve? We need you, you know. We need help in so many different areas to produce disciples here on a Sunday morning. And listen, don't hear me wrong. You need to be doing this outside of this building as well. You need to be doing this with your employees and with those you work alongside with and in your home with your wife, and with your husband and your kids. But I know for a fact we need help here. I know for a fact that the four guys that serve on the parking team would love a little help. I know for a fact that our children's and student numbers continue to just rise. I don't know what God's doing, but he's continuing to bring more and more kids here. And we need help to teach and love and, and serve them. Francis Chan goes on to say, imagine this. Imagine gathering with a group of people who were trying to outserve one another. Have you ever been in a room filled with humble people who count others more significant than themselves? It's anything but burdensome. I mean, like, what if you knew that every Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, you were going to go gather with your gospel community, and you just knew that everyone going there was so amped up to just love one another and just serve one another and care for one another and, and hear the stories that they had from the past week. And that maybe one night you go to Chili's instead of your house and your gospel community is at Chili's and the waitress is just like, what is up with these people? No one wants to order first. They're just, they're eyeball to eyeball, caring and loving for one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another and humbly lay down your own life and serve. I end with this, verse 17. Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Of all that you've read here in John 13 and all that you've heard me say this morning, you now know. And Jesus says here, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The Lord speaks through James saying it this way, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And we know this word blessed that Jesus uses. That Jesus is saying, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, Psalm 1. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. He produces fruit. He prospers in everything that he does. He's blessed. Makarios. He is happy is what he's saying. He is filled with joy and fulfilled. One author summarizes the Gospel of John by calling it the surprising route to joy. In his summary of the Gospel of John, he writes from the perspective of God the Father, where he says this, quote, to really live is to release my son's life through yours in any circumstance, no matter what you feel. To relate as he related, giving when no one gives back, loving when no one returns love, forgiving when no one deserves forgiveness, and suffering in the place of those who should suffer. Church, Jesus has handed us a promise, a promise for your joy. That in receiving the enabling love and grace of God, that you ought to be loving one another just as he loved you. In humble, bucket-filling service, and if you do, the promise is there in verse 17, you will be happy, blessed, are those who do it. Bow your head and close your eyes. In no way do I want to rob you of the joy that God has handed us through Jesus. And so you might have that red card in your hand, and I just can't encourage you enough to join along in this story at Grace Community Bible Church that Christ has called us to together. 
And on your way, drop that in the basket. Get a t-shirt. Oh, Father. You've washed us clean. We are clean, but our feet need a washing. Thank you for Jesus. In his name, amen.